Thank you, John. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation. And the whole framework that you laid out um, just speaks to all of the technology innovations as a, as a, as a, a, a number of dimensions that we could be looking at. So I'm, um, I think it's a, a really useful framing, and I hope that maybe we can touch on it uh, later in the closing comments. Uh, so I have the unique pleasure of being the last uh, main panel um, and dealing with things that I think are kind of seminal to, to this whole discussion of how do we make regulation more dynamic and more iterative, which is what's the underlying technology. With that said, um, we cannot in this, in this panel or even in a workshop uh, articulate all of the different technology opportunities that one might have in the, uh, whether it's at the, at the device level, at the service level, at the data level, what it might be uh, that, that could make be a part of a, a faster, more iterative uh, regulatory spectrum management framework. Um, but what we did do is we uh, asked uh, the five panelists who are experts in different domains that are very relevant to this space. And that's going to be today's discussion. We're going to start uh, with our five guests going through some of the thoughts that they have in terms of what's the emerging technology that could have uh, some of the biggest bang for the buck, kind of an iterative uh, spectrum management process. And then we're going to have uh, a set of, of questions uh, as well as questions from the uh, from the audience. So I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I want to go through, I'll, I'll quickly talk about who's going to speak and in what order. And then I'm going to turn it over. So we have uh, Charlie Bayless, who is a professor of electrical engineering at Baylor. We then have uh, Shannon Blunt, who's a professor of electrical engineering at uh, New, uh, University of Kansas. Uh, David Jackson, who's a professor of electrical engineering at University of Houston. Uh, John Cousins, well, actually, uh, the order is uh, Tommaso um, Malavia who is a professor at, uh, of electrical engineering at Northeastern. And then wrapping it up is John Cousins, who's the vice president of, of spectrum policy at Qualcomm. And I did that very purposely because I think as we talk about all these def different technologies, John can end with some of the things that are happening in industry and some of the things that are being thought of at that level. So I think this is going to be a very interesting set of discussions, and I look forward to hearing questions from the audience. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Charlie, you got the stage. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as part of this panel. Uh, I'm Charlie Bayless, as Doug mentioned. I, I'm at Baylor University as a faculty member there. The, the technology enabler, is, is, as John Chapin was speaking a moment ago, he was talking about iterative policy and being able to iterate policy more quickly. And one of the things that is going to enable iterative policy is reconfigurable circuitry. Being able to, down at the bottom level, have the capability of making an edge device adapt its actual physical performance in real time to be able to enable the flexible use of spectrum and spatial parameters to share. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to acknowledge that the funding for the brief uh, comments I'm about to make, uh, some of the research has been funded by the Army Research Lab, the Office of Naval Research, and also the National Science Foundation. If we could go to the next slide. So enabling iterative spectrum policy through reconfigurable circuits, how do we want to do that? Well, rigid circuitry could limit iterative spectrum policy, moving from rigid to real-time adaptive. The problem is, is a lot of the legacy systems out there right now have either rigid, inflexible front ends for their transmitters and receivers, or perhaps even broadband front ends, which that's an improvement sometimes, but it can also be a degradation of what could be if we could reconfigure. So for example, here's a couple examples due to the lack of circuit reconfigurability where our systems could be limited in being able to shift in, in frequency use in real time. In the S-band, military radar loses range when changing in frequency to avoid wireless communication. This is a pertinent topic with the sharing of the 3.45 to 3.7 gigahertz band, soon to be the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band. If a radar shifts in frequency, it needs to be able to optimize its range and still be able to transmit and detect at the same range. However, it's a well-known fact in microwave circuitry that the impedance termination of a power amplifier that is optimal for output power is actually frequency dependent. 
So if I'm operating at 3.3 gigahertz and I move to 3.1 gigahertz, I'm no longer going to be getting maximum range if I'm terminated in the 3.1 gigahertz as optimum impedance. I would like to be able to reconfigure and re-optimize my range. Another example that we're dealing with right now in, in our NSF-funded work is a 24 gigahertz 5G network right now must turn off to avoid passive sensors during operation. If there's, for example, a weather radiometer which needs to detect water at 23.6 gigahertz, the only thing we can do is turn off the 5G network. Could we do some things to perhaps reorient the 5G network and make it reconfigurable to circuit level in real time to avoid the passive sensor so it can continue to operate? That's a question we're asking. So the potential impact, obviously, is if we can reconfigure an S-band now, we can maintain the detection range. Now, we need to be able to reconfigure probably within a millisecond if we're operating a radar in, in concert with its pulse uh, repetition rate and also its pulse length. And then also, can we spatially distribute a 24 gigahertz 5G network? And briefly, just want to run through a couple examples if you go to the next slide. So let's zoom in on these examples just a little bit. There's a video on the top right. That picture on the top right is actually a video. If you would click on that, you'll be able to see it playing. If not, that's OK. We'll, we'll make do without it. But I think that video on the top right should, should play, actually. So anyway, what you will see if that video is able to play is there is a, a spectrum plot in the top left. We have a reconfigurable impedance tuner that we've developed in collaboration with Purdue University. They developed this tuner and we put it in and we've demonstrated the change in calculated radar range that's available if we actually, as the frequency shifts, reconfigure this impedance tuner to rematch our power amplifier. And the goal that we're really meeting is shown in the bottom left of the slide where we can increase our detection range by putting this tunable matching network in between the power amplifier and the antenna. Now, through the Navy funding, we've actually been able to do this down to the level of 600 microseconds reconfigurability using a tuner that's based on plasma switches. And because the tuner is electrically actuated, we can actually now uh, reconfigure on a pulse-to-pulse -pulse basis with the radar. We're going to be presenting that next week at uh, IMS in Denver, actually. Next slide, if you would. So this is a second example. I mentioned the 24 gigahertz system where it, we're operating 5G at 24 gigahertz, but at 23.6 gigahertz, we need to be able to uh, maintain the ability to detect water vapor in the atmosphere. We don't want to interfere. So what we can do is put impedance tuners between the amplifiers and the antennas in each element of a phased array. And we can do directional transmissions where we can transmit in multiple directions at the same time out of the same aperture. Now, one of the problems with this is you can actually have nonlinearities in your power amplifier that cause unwanted transmission beams. Uh, as we've shown in some of our work, you can see on the left and the uh, bottom, the, if we don't tune, but we can actually do impedance tuning to linearize our transmissions to avoid these unwanted beams and make sure that our interference is kept out of the non-intended directions. Next slide, if you would. Finally, I'd like to go to the third example, which is a spatial spectral broker. This is a, a this has the ability to do iterative spectrum management and be a middleman between the system and the circuit level. And this is something we're working on through funding from the NSF SWIFT program. If you see on the left, we're working with a bunch of radiometers and we have this broker that takes in manifold requests, which you can see on the top right. The manifold request is essentially what what uh, resources are needed by each spectrum user. And then a broker compares the request between different systems and decides which system can use the what resources. And we actually output out of this broker a spectral spatial mask that allows us to limit the spectral spatial transmissions. If you go to the last slide. So in conclusions, iterative spectrum usage must progress from completely rigid spectrum to as close as, to real-time assignment as possible. And this is governed by the scenario. But circuits right now are limiting the ability to do that. So we need to be able to develop circuit reconfiguration both at the circuit level and at the array level. And this is something we're working on to enable this iterative spectrum management. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, very interesting set of research topics, and we'll come back to a couple of the topics that you covered as we um, uh, speak with the others. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Shannon now to uh, go. All right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, let's see if we pull the slides. All right. Thank you for uh, being here and um, having the chance to uh, wax philosophical, um, which, as 
Doug knows I, I like to do a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm very much a radar guy. Um, so I'm going to talk about some things really from a radar centric perspective as it relates to, uh, to spectrum sharing, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, radars generally viewed somewhat as old technology. It's been around for a bit. Uh, it had a big impact on world war II. Um, obviously we all know of it from air traffic control and weather, uh, tracking. Um, but nowadays we're actually seeing an explosion in the number of applications uh, for radar. Automotive is, is a big one, uh, hand gesture recognition, tracking of space debris, and there are a lot of others. And on top of that, one of the things that is occurring in the radar space, it really dovetails with what has occurred in the last few decades, you know, for the reason why we all have, you know, these wonders of technology in our pockets or basically pocket supercomputers is that digital revolution. Well, it's likewise having an impact in the radar space. So this notion of a radar as some static entity that we can look at as well, it's going to behave a certain way, we're going to see that change too over time because you're seeing things like large scaled um, ACEs, agile waveforms, um, radars becoming itself more dynamic driven by a, uh, a cognitive paradigm, more sophisticated interference cancellation, which is really good for everybody, uh, as well as uh, multi-static uh, MIMO operation. All of these are contributing in various ways to, to enable new types of radar modes. Um, and so really where I'm going with that is th we do need to be careful not to necessarily just paint radar in a box of, okay, it's gonna be there doing its thing because we're gonna see that change over time. Uh, next slide, please. So putting this now in a spectrum context, so I mentioned the cognitive aspect, a significant driver of what we're gonna see in terms of emerging radar technology is the same thing we're seeing for a lot of these other technologies that use spectrum. And that is a software driven platform uh, or software driven capabilities, which really allows these now sensing to occur or the, the dynamic operation of sensing to occur at machine speeds. Now that, that obviously creates other difficulties, which I, I'm going to touch on in a second. Uh, but, but, you know, just bear in mind that what this means is again, we're not going to be talking about some static system anymore. It's likewise going to be trying to dynamically operate. Now, one of the, one of the documents here um, from the standpoint of deploying that capability in radar space, and I should say, radars have been dynamic for a long time. They've just been dynamic at lower speed. Um, given the current operating environment, that's going to have to increase. One of the limits, sort of, is not really a technical limit, it's more having to do with the research community. And the I'll touch on this later based on some of the questions that I've posted. Uh, I'm doing some very much on my uh, But one of the limiting factors actually becomes the research in the community um, seems to not really fully appreciate the intricacies of the problem. So I, I went and, and really it gets to this notion of there seems to be a bit of an over abstraction. So consider a few aspects of data. We're talking about High dynamic range, many tens of dB, there are some systems that exceed 100 dB of dynamic range. Okay? As well as high fidelity and coherence. This is required for any type of interference cancellation. And then related to that, in some cases, very, very high dimensionality. And that's how coherent integration is. Okay? But yet, on the flip side, these systems have to deal with, well, for one, one of the biggest sources of interference sometimes is the radar itself, uh, both from clutter produced in the uh, by scattering from the environment, as well as just the fidelity limiting aspect of transmitter distortion. If you're trying to transmit at high power, um, there is obviously one of the reasons we're here talking about this is that growing uh, ubiquitous interference, as well as a dynamic interference aspect. And then, of course, flipping that around, there is a push within the radar community to essentially to become a better spectral neighbor. How do we, from a radar standpoint, try to mitigate interference to other users that are sharing the band as opposed to just saying, hey, leave us alone? Okay. 
Uh, next slide, please. So to kind of tie some of those things together, I've I've highlighted three, and one of them is probably a bit controversial, at least to radar folks. Um, uh, kind of hurdles slash opportunities. Uh, one I've touched on, uh, the one at the top already, and that's this notion that as radar systems themselves become more dynamic, really this notion of cognitive radar, then you end up with this sort of cognitive versus cognitive paradigm, which in its sense is not really a new thing. We've, we've all known as things become more dynamic, this is going to start to occur. But consider it from a radar-centric perspective. So radars, as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, require coherency, require fidelity. Well, what this is going to do is introduce more non-stationarity, which is actually going to impact one of these facets that radar really needs. And this is both from the standpoint of dynamic interference, as well as as a radar tries to itself become dynamic to reduce the mutual interference. It's kind of interesting that as it tries to solve that problem, it actually introduces more problems upon itself through this non-stationarity. Um, there's also a trend toward, uh, this is part of the, the 6G paradigm in particular, towards um, more airborne and space-based communication nodes. Well, a lot of the work that is looked at from the standpoint of interference from a radar uh, perspective is sort of under the assumption that a lot of the commercial comm is going to be terrestrial-based. Well, now adding this elevation dimension really complicates that problem. Um, a way, sort of, a way forward, I won't say it's a solution, but is really the consideration of more sophisticated interference cancellation. For any of you who might be familiar with the notion of STAP, it's a space-time adaptive processing used in airborne and space-based radar. What they do is they couple the domains of really Doppler and spatial angle. And that coupling introduces a multiplicative increase in degrees of freedom. Well, that's great because more degrees of freedom means more ability to suppress interference, assuming you don't have your uh, front end is saturated. But that also comes with the curse of dimensionality that you now have to process at a much higher level. Now, I mention that because philosophically, you can now start thinking about coupling different uh, other different dimensions as a way to get to higher dimensionality to then combat increasing amounts of interference. And then finally, and this is the one that's probably the more controversial, um, particularly to the radar folks. So um, the other day, uh, John Chapin asked me this question about, well, what, what's the impact of uh, really solid state ampli uh, power amplifiers, which means we can now have longer pulses or essentially higher duty cycle uh, radar operation. What's that going to do? Um, I will tell you that there's an interesting report that the NTIA put out a few years ago that really assessed kind of the trade space of uh, duty cycle. Well, now consider going to higher and higher duty cycles, potentially, here's the controversial part, potentially even pushing to 100%. So now all of a sudden we have a radar that's operating essentially in a CW mode. Now, there are radars that do that now, but they tend to be low power, short range, partly because they have repeating structure. If you introduce a non-repeating structure in that, you now have potentially the ability to start trading off what a pulse radar could do, possibly in a CW mode. And it introduces an interesting trade space because you can reduce peak power, but, and, and I will say from the radar standpoint, there's some potentially very interesting prospects there uh, from the standpoint of uh, coherent integration benefits. But now to from the standpoint of the interference to other users, well, a lot of comm systems think of pulsed radars acting like shot noise. Well, it's not shot noise anymore. So it puts it into a different part of that interference trade space. So um, with that, I'll, I'll leave some more for discussion for later. Uh, thank you, Doug. Thanks, Shannon. Very interesting talk. Uh, you know, and again, we're seeing both Charlie and Shannon's discussions sort of taking the um, system of devices perspective and thinking about the services and pointing out some of the challenges that we're going to have as we go into this more dynamic use, uh, whether it be the issues of stationarity or other such things. But I also think it's interesting to know that you know some of our assumptions about what the service was and how it operated and how how it how it should operate 
could very much change. And I think that's going to be a really interesting dynamic and maybe maybe a part of uh, John's uh, fast interference litigation uh, structures as he, as he moves forward. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me ask uh, Professor Jackson to go. Okay, hello. Uh, let's see, am I able to uh, share my screen? Can I, can I do that? We have your slides um, on our end, David. Well, I, yeah, if I share it, it'd be nicer because I could then you know, use my pointer a little bit. But okay, there you go. Can everybody see that? Is that okay? Can you make it bigger? Let's see, it's as big as I can make it on my end. I can read it. Okay. All right, so um, welcome everybody. So my brief presentation here is gonna be active electromagnetic interference or EMI cancellation approach. I'd like to recognize my co-authors involved in the research as well. So what is active EMI or electromagnetic interference cancellation? Talk a little bit about that. And can it really work? That's the fundamental question I wanna pose here. I wanna give some preliminary results uh, in two categories. One will be reducing the scattered fields from an object because scattered fields can cause electromagnetic interference. And I also want to give an example where we might be able to reduce what I might call a quiet protected region or zone. In other words, a, a, an electromagnetically quiet region where there may be some sensitive installation like a radio telescope or something that you want to really protect and not have any interference in that region. Uh, we have very preliminary results here in this paper from a couple of years ago but this is really just a project that we're getting started on. Okay, what is active cancellation? Now, I think we all know about noise canceling headphones. So that's kind of a very simple example of, of active cancellation. You might have an interfering signal coming in from outside and the electronics and the headphone generates its own countering signal to counsel that interference so that the user hears only the music that they wanna hear or whatever and not this interference coming from the outside. It's almost a perfect cancellation. So that works very good with audio frequencies, uh, like headphones, but here's the fundamental question. Can the same kind of principle work for radio frequency signals, electromagnetic signals, like for example, at microwave bands, can we actually reduce electromagnetic interference at those kind of bands? Now, here is a simple experiment that we did to investigate the feasibility of this. I'm going to try to reduce the electromagnetic scattering from an object. Now, in this simple demonstration, the object is a very simple metal plate, roughly about one foot by one foot. But visualize, if you would, that the metal plate is just a simple model for something more elaborate, which could be a building or a tower, something that's scattering a signal, and that signal is causing interference. So we have an incident wave coming from a distant transmitter hitting the metal plate of the object, it's producing a scattered signal which is going off and causing interference in some direction and we want to see if we can reduce that scattered signal that's going off in a direction maybe towards a sensitive installation now we put a, our own radiating antenna on the electro on the substrate here with a sensor and an electronic system the electronic system takes the signal picked up by the sensor and it amplifies it and phase shifts it and feeds it back into the antenna and that antenna then radiates a countering signal that tries to eliminate the scattered signal that's going off in this direction toward the sensitive location. And the idea is that if we calibrate the electronic system properly by choosing the phase shift and the amplification, we can greatly eliminate the scattered signal at least at one frequency, the center frequency of the signal. Now, here's a simple numerical illustration. Here's the incident wave coming in. It just looks like a blob because it's a microwave signal and it's oscillating so fast that you can't signal, but can't see anything. But notice that in this normalized scale, the level is one. Now here's the scattered signal from this metal plate. The red dashed line indicates the level that would be present if the system was not activated. But with this electronic system activated, this shows the scattered signal. You can see the level is greatly reduced from what it would have been without the electronic system. Now you see sharp spikes at the leading and trailing edges of the pulse. That's because it takes some time for the information to process, get processed by the system to go from the sensor through the electronics and re-radiate from the patch. During that time, we can, the system cannot radiate an effective countering signal. 
In other words, we're processing with electronics at the speed of light. So we, that, that's the best we can do. And the signal's coming in at the speed of light. So it's always going to be from causality, those spikes at the trailing and leading edges. But the good news is that overall energy has been greatly reduced compared to what you would have without the system. Here's a second application where I'm using just one frequency now, not a time rank signal, just to keep it simple. And I have a plane wave coming in here along the ground, and it's going to cause interference in this region here. I want to protect this region, a rectangular region of interest. We put our own phased array there, in this case, a phased array of 201 elements, and it's going to radiate its own pseudo plane wave propagating in this direction to cancel the incident plane wave coming in. So we get an interference effect to create a null or a greatly reduced overall signal in this quiet, protected region. We're doing it at 3 gigahertz, and the width of the phased array is 60 feet. Now, for numerical simulations, here's what we get. So you can see from the color map here that we have greatly reduced the overall field level in this quiet region. Here's the width of the phased array. And in that region that's roughly the width of the phased array, we get a fairly quiet and protected zone. If you take a slice, horizontal slice, through this rectangular quiet region, you can see the plot here. So we get a nice protected region, but then outside the boundaries of the phased array, the field increases very, very rapidly. So it's, it's not successful at reducing everywhere, but a certain protected region can be created, which is roughly the width of the phased array. So my conclusions are active cancellation may possibly be a tool that we can use to augment existing strategies for e EMI reduction in the future. There's different ways we can use this. We're going to do scattering from an object if that's causing interference, or we can actually try to directly cancel incoming waves, creating some kind of a quiet zone. Now, the method is not perfect, especially for time varying signals, because we're canceling the signal using electronics, which processes at the speed of light, and the signal's coming in at the speed of light. But still, the preliminary results seem to indicate that it's a promising technique and we can greatly reduce the overall energy that's scattered or that's available, available to cause interference in this quiet zone. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, and as you could see, uh, I very purposely had David come after uh, Charlie and Shannon because I wanted to get down into kind of like the active methods uh, for cancellation. And you can see also that what David's described uh, you know, really fits in again with John Chapin's kind of uh, fast interference mitigation kind of concepts. This gets down into the, you know, the quick response uh, opportunities. And while not perfect, it is, it is kind of the bleeding edge re research. And of course, as I said at the beginning, this is just one uh, of many, 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 many areas that we could talk about in terms of dynamic spectrum management. Uh, there are at least five other areas of um, um, uh, cancellation that I'm, I, I've been following in this space that take very different approaches than what David's doing. So I think, again, this is what's what's neat here is that we're moving from this very fixed mentality of of how we use the spectrum from decades ago to a whole different way of thinking about it. And what that means in terms of how we built the devices and how the service operates, and as Shannon said, even what the service does, how we conceive it. Uh, really gets gets to be very interesting. Uh, up next uh, is Professor Melodia, uh, and Tommaso is going to talk. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna tell us how he's gonna conquer spectrum, uh, which I, I love that term. So with that, I want to turn it over, Tommaso. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I come from uh, the world of um, wireless networks, wireless systems, and obviously spectrum for. Uh, uh, 6G is part of uh, uh, ongoing discussions, right? And 6G will require new spectrum bands, uh, and it will also operate concurrently in 5G bands to support transition between 5G and 6G. And spectrum will certainly be heterogeneous. It will include licensed, unlicensed, and shared spectrum bands in the low bands, in the mid bands, upper mid bands, in addition to millimeter wave, and possibly sub terahertz bands. So next, please. Um, we need to develop the intellectual foundations, practical technologies, and policy recommendations, as well, I think, as an agile spectrum-educated workforce to enable a more flexible spectrum future. But what does a more flexible spectrum future look like? We certainly want more spectrum for all, what we call conquering the spectrum, by unveiling untapped spectrum in the upper frontier, in the sub band, but also in the upper mid-bands. We need dynamic and predictable use of spectrum, 
uh, what we like to call programming the spectrum through virtualization, um, uh, softwareization, and algorithmic innovation in this space. We want security and protection for spectrum users, what we refer to as protecting the spectrum. And I think we need to develop a really new clean slate approaches to uh, leverage these new spectrum bands that are not available today, including the millimeter wave and subterrestrial spectrum bands, and new AI methods to softwareize spectrum access and to learn to share portions of the spectrum among different uh, uh, systems and applications. There are certainly core differences between the mid bands and the uh, high frequency bands with different challenges and uh, different technologies. Uh, in the mid bands, especially in uh, cellular bands, the spectrum is crowded. And the main challenge is to deal with incumbents, co channel interference, uh, uh, out of band interference. And in a sense, it's an, it's an old problem, but I think we have new tools today to deal with it. On the hardware side, um, new frequency agile front ends that will enable spatial diversity through multiple antennas are clearly the need of the hour. Uh, and, and also the understanding from a systems level of how to leverage these capabilities um, to, to, to create uh, um, more diversity. Uh, and at the same time, I think they're the key enabler for spectrum sharing. I also believe that uh, softwareization, virtualization, and artificial intelligence will play a key role here. Um, next, please. When we talk, uh, for example, about the, uh, the work that is being done by the Oran Alliance, uh, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, work focusing on interoperability and availability of open interface and the effects that that can have on markets. But um, besides this disaggregation, I think the real disruptive innovation uh, with the open RAN architecture lies in exposing network control knobs and spectrum control knobs, if you will, and analytics to a centralized programming platform that is referred to as the RAN Intelligent Controller. Now, this enables access to sophisticated spectrum sensing information that were completely unavailable in the past, uh, which can be processed and combined with database-driven approaches to obtain a fine-grained control of the networking functionalities and of the physical resources at all layers of the protocol stack to guarantee sharing uh, and coexistence between, uh, you know, for example, uh, Wi-Fi and cellular in unlicensed bands, but also sharing between commercial systems and gover government uh, focused systems like, like Radar or others, and sharing between uh, different commercial systems in the same channels. Um, and, you know, the latter can also happen through other uh, techniques, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, next, please. As I said, Northeastern, we are, we are investigating um, a, a number of these techniques. Uh, this is an example of recent work that we presented at Infocom 2022, uh, which were in an open run context that we really uh, investigated the nexus between softwareization, uh, spectrum sharing, and algorithmic innovation based on AI. We developed a um, framework based on open run for spectrum sensing and channel selection that leverages information and control knobs exposed through ORAN interfaces. An agent running on the near real-time run intelligent controller can collect uh, information to train deep reinforcement learning agents that can control the radio units to reactively um, switch cell frequencies as well as various uh, other parameters of the communication process um, in, in real time to avoid Wi-Fi activity. Right, and decision making happens through these deep neural networks that run on the near real time rake. Uh, and uh, it's, it's being tested at scale in the Colosseum wireless network emulator uh, to collect specifically large scale well formed data sets that we use to train um, the neural networks. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a first step. I think the results are quite encouraging. With a pool of shared frequency channels, Wi Fi and cellular can coexist seamlessly through open run control. So there's no reason to believe that you couldn't. To the same, for example, in the upper mid bands, uh, which are covered with a number of incumbent users. And that's um, what I wanted to cover today. Thank you, Tommaso. And you can see now we've gone up to the kind of the system of systems uh, view of, of how you can approach uh, this, this problem, right? And, and again, thinking back to John's dimensions, it, it might also be changing how quickly we can respond and, and, and the consequence in that fast uh, interference mitigation. But this now gets to a point where we actually have uh, a means of um, throwing oracles and other capabilities that, that integratingly uh, solving the problem, which I think is, is, is a very interesting and powerful kind of approach to the problem. Um, so thank you. And now uh, we're going to turn to John Cousins from uh, Qualcomm.
And John's really going to kind of take it up another level, which is really think about how might we apply some of this technology to, to certain bands and to certain services and, and what it might look like. So, John, please. Thanks a lot, Doug. So um, first off, I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the symposium. And I also thought that John Chapin's presentation that set up this panel particularly helpful regarding interference protection because you it is critically important to look at both the detection and the response speeds with regard to the services that we're looking to share with. So Qualcomm has been very actively studying new approaches to spectrum regulation in order to enable more intensive spectrum sharing among uh, diverse and unaffiliated users for a number of years. And you've just heard a lot of great material on the technical side of improving spectrum access. On the regulatory side, there are ways to improve spectrum access and reliability in spectrum that's regulated as unlicensed and or shared uh, using, in our view, very simple technology neutral rules that enable such tools. So we at Qualcomm have, it, have encouraged regulators to adopt um, enabling rules to, to implement these concepts, but it's taking some time. We're going to keep at it both in standards bodies and with regulatory authorities because we know it's going to improve spectrum efficiencies and support the growth that we're going to continue to experience and have to enable. So um, at looking at the FCC in particular, and it also applies generally to, to other regulators, uh, rules governing spectrum access have relied on two regulatory paradigms licensed access and unlicensed access. And both paradigms generally have the regulator define in-band power levels and out-of-band emissions. Power levels for licensed services are generally higher than the power levels for unlicensed services to enable broad coverage areas. And interference is handled differently, however. So licensed services have legal protection from interference and the regulator will take action against entities that cause interference to licensed services. And because licensed services permit higher power to basically cover areas that are several miles in radius in, in many cases, in the case of mobile services, for example, exclusively licensed spectrum allows a single entity like a mobile operator to manage spectrum access by multiple users on an interference free basis. So the tools that a mobile operator uses today include many different techniques, but a lot of them are based on um, synchronized access, advanced antenna systems, and other tools that work very well when one entity controls access. So we look at this and we believe that many of these tools can be used to improve spectrum access um, that are the tools that are used to improve spectrum access in, in license bands can actually enable increased utilization in shared and unlicensed band. And that's one area where we look for inspiration. So as most of you know, unlicensed services have no interference protection and they're required to accept interference from licensed and other spectrum users. And unlicensed services work well in general in smaller areas um, where the communications range is in tens of meters and interference remediation in general is under the control and managed by the end user. But there are regulatory approaches that can be used even in unlicensed band that enable much more intensive spectrum use in, in bands that are unlicensed that are shared that actually can enable multiple licensees to operate on the same spectrum at the same time and place. So for, for more reliable unlicensed communications, uh, it, it would be possible to implement a rule that require time synchronization that would allow these advanced techniques to allow multiple unaffiliated users to use spatial sharing to provide much more predictable access and therefore support um, very low latency, improved throughput, and essentially much more efficient spectrum access. So 
one of the things that Qualcomm proposed several years ago when the FCC was first implementing the rules in the six gigahertz band was we offered a rule that set limits on channel occupancy times that actually we showed wouldn't favor asynchronous nodes over synchronous nodes and vice versa, but would effectively lead to much more efficient spectrum access that by, by forcing the asynchronous nodes to communicate in a synchronous manner. Um, this is something that wasn't adopted, but you know, it's definitely something that should be considered. We know that standards bodies are considering a rule such as this, but as we look to open up new bands, implementing a simple technology rule, a technology neutral rule that would implement this is something that's definitely worth considering in our view. And then another, another approach looking at what has been defined as a licensed shared band in, in, um, July of 2016, when the FCC opened up a bunch of millimeter wave bands effectively for 5G, there was a piece of spectrum that's referred to as the lower 37 gigahertz band, which is a 600 megahertz wide band uh, that was allocated for shared licensed use, but it still hasn't been opened. So we have proposed an approach that would allow multiple licensees to operate on the same spectrum at the same time and place without causing harmful interference to one another. So unlike unlicensed um, approaches where heavy use can swamp the medium, licensed sharing proposal that we've put forth for this band would allow a limited set of operators to share spectrum on an interference-free basis by effectively mandating synchronized listening intervals that would allow licensees to identify potentially vulnerable receivers. So in our proposal in this 600 megahertz band, there could be six licensees, each that had a 100 megahertz priority license where each is able to operate across the entire band in the same place and time, so long as they listen before operating on another spectrum uh, that, that on which they have secondary access. And we've done extensive work. Uh, we've had uh, demos at Mobile World Congress that essentially show that this approach provides much greater spectral utilization, improved throughput with a quality of service that's akin to what can be provided today in exclusively licensed spectrum. So these techniques are focused on increasing the likelihood that communications are successfully received when they're transmitted and use the least amount of transmit power to ensure successful transmissions. And this provides obviously power efficiencies. Green communications is a big focus. As we start to ramp up connecting the internet of things, it is critically important that these devices operate with the least amount of power. So this has been a focus of the FCC, in particular, uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. And, you know, energy efficient communications were a key part of 5G and green communications are only going to grow in importance as we move to 6G and beyond. So thanks for the time today, and I look forward to the questions from you, Doug, the audience, as well as the remarks from the other panelists. Thank you, John. And I think uh, I really liked having John wrap it up at the end, because what you can see here is, um, you know, there's there's technologies that are being implemented, and, you know, it's like smarter versions of listen before talk, right? We, we all know the, the, the approach, we know the goodness of it, we know what you can do. But applied in new ways, uh, you know, it just shows the low hanging fruit and the opportunities that we can do to to be more efficient. Um, and you know, as as we start opening up that aperture and start adding more and more technology solutions to this problem of you know, rapid, uh, dynamic, and iterative uh, spectrum management, it's and I think it I think it's just going to be an endless amount of opportunity for research. Um, I did want to ask one question to the to the group, and then we'll then we'll start jumping in. Um, into the uh, questions from the from the audience. Um, let me ask you this, and I don't know. Um, you can just answer. Anyone who has an idea, just throw it out. What should we not be doing? What what technical approach should we avoid at this point? What's too expensive, too hard, too inefficient? Whatever whatever dimension of of well, probably not that way. And it, I know it's a little bit of a curveball, but I thought it'd be interesting to start start there and then kind of 
walk back to uh, all the way back to listen before talk. So any ideas, gang? Maybe what we should have we doing nothing. <laughs> we know it's an important issue and we have to come up with innovative strategies. I'll, I'll chime in. I'll use this as a chance to get back on my soapbox, Doug. Um, one thing we should not do is, uh, and I, I, I'm going to point a little bit of a finger here, but it, it's it's broadly, but it's uh, is keep doing very theoretical studies that are not physically meaningful because there are, and, and so I, I come from, um, I, I'm a radar guy, but really I come from the signal processing community and that community really looks at a lot of these kinds of problems, but I see so many papers that I, my eyes hurt from rolling them so much because it's just the, it's it's very very theoretical without considering the the physical aspects of the problem. I, I'll, I'll go again to that you know that when I mentioned earlier in radar, many many tens of dB of dynamic range, and you know there will be assumptions or I, I, as I like to tell my students, the most dangerous assumption is the one you don't know you're making, you know, things like, Oh, well, we'll assume it's band limited, not unless it's infinite in time. So, you know, dealing with spectrum roll off things like this, you know, the fact that aliasing is always there because nothing is truly band limited. It's, it's all these little theoretical assumptions that, yeah, you can go crank out papers all day long, but things just don't make that connection to the real world. Not, you, you can't even do bench top testing with them sometimes. So that's, I will step back off my soapbox now, but I, I had to say that. I like those both. I love the, well, let's not do nothing. <laughs> and let's, let's not be theoretical. Uh, any, any other comments from the gang? I, I would just want to add, I, I agree 100% with, with the two um, don't do so far. Um, uh, I, I would just add, we, we really need to um, go beyond silos in, in various different disciplines, right? It's, uh, th these are problems that require, you know, any communication problem or inference problem is also a computational problem. It has the physics and uh, um, limitations of devices. And, you know, we, we, we really need to go beyond silos. And it's, uh, um, it's hard to do in academia because the incentives are not well aligned to do that. But I think we can, we can do better. <laughs> Tommaso, I'm going to go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, one thing I would add is, um, and, and I think I think we're moving in this direction. It's it's not as fast as we would like, but we're moving in this direction, which is away from absolute interference protection and really looking at what level of noise in your band can you handle and, and still operate effectively. And I think, you know, just as an example, the FCC's decision in the six gigahertz band that you know, allows unlicensed communications in a manner that does not provide absolute protection to the incumbent users, but instead, in the FCC's estimation, and I believe they're right, makes interference highly unlikely, but not impossible, because there's a lot, as you all know, there's a lot of this gray space. There's so much of this gray space where two services can operate pretty darn well. And as soon as you say, you know, NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard, get the hell away from me. You close that off. And at least now regulators and hopefully the federal users are recognizing that there's benefits to actually having picnics in your backyard and saying, you know, come on in, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about what we can do together. And I, I, I think we're moving there because we have to, and that's a good thing. Charlie, I was, did you, I was, you know, John, I think your, your comments piggybacked on Tommaso as well. And I was going to make a comment that really we've got to not only move beyond silos, but I think we have to move beyond our level. And I think those those comments are actually one and the same. You know, I, I think this is great, this panel today, because I think John's John's intent in setting this up and Doug's intent is really to say, look, we want to enable iterative policy, but technology has to be there to enable it. And, Obviously, on this panel, we're looking at technology at multiple levels, but I, as a circuit person, can't do my work effectively unless I know what the system person, i.e. Shannon or Tommaso, is doing. And I, and they need to be informed by the policy person. And I think the more that we can build 
situations where we can work together instead of in our isolated levels, multi, you know, we've got this multi levels from policy to circuit. If we can avoid working in our own level, but work with others in different levels, we're going to make more and quicker progress on this. So this is a great start. I appreciate the fact that, you know, we're having an eye on iterative policy and how do we enable that? That's a, that's a great start. And that's the framework I think we have to have. So yeah. don't, don't work in silos. Don't work on your own level exclusively, I guess would be my, my don't comment. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And, um, you know, uh, getting started, I guess, is what David really was saying. Let's do something. Um, but John's point, I mean, I can't tell you years back, you know, when I was in government, how frustrating it would be the absolutes of spectrum interference issues. And, uh, you know, we, have, you know, that's been talked about for years, how we how we open that and get a little more flexible and a little more tolerant. And I think we, we really need that. We need to accept that model. But at the same time, I think we can probably do things in the technology space that could really just fundamentally um, uh, change the way that we think about um, interference impacting our services. So there, there's so many there's so many levels to this problem, even from just a technology perspective. That to iterate through all of that would, would be, you know, again, uh, a number of different workshops. So I do want to I did want to uh, pull some of the questions, and I, I think I'm going to. I'm going to grab the one which said, um, and I'm not going to ask David, but it's a David question, which is active cancellation. I'm going to ask the others, where should we throw, where where, where are good bands or where are good services for active cancellation? And then, you know, I could, I could pick on Shannon, which would be, you know, you know that you know the stuff because, you know, David and Shannon and I and Charlie are working together. Um, you know what David's proposing. Um, how does this play in the, in the spectrum, in the uh, radar space? Uh, could it play in the continuous? Uh, could you have a CW that would sit in that middle that middle part of that zone that he had, and then still have uh, you know interesting you know operational radars? Well, to tell you the truth, going to something that is like more CW would probably be more amenable. And, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna claim a bit of naivete. I I know what David's doing, but not to the level of being an expert in it, but the you know when you're talking about high power and pulsed systems the uh the transient effects at the beginning into the pulse um i mean they make things harder to deal with and you get spectral spreading from those uh those regions um going to something that is uh well at a minimum higher duty cycle or you know at the extreme more of a cw you you basically just have more of a stationarity uh to the problem that I, I suspect would would work better in that context um, to actually allow you to uh, to cancel regions uh, without getting you know the transient effects where you're going to have any type of interference spikes. That's that's at least kind of off the cuff answer. Charlie, Tommaso, John. We can move on. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a bunch of questions that are popping in. And by the way, if the, if the, the panelists uh, see a question they want to grab, uh, please let me know. I'm, I'm happy for us to, to jump in as, as a group and just kind of parse them. Um, but I did want to take this next, the next one that I saw, which was uh, how quantifiably better is this compared to the passive noise cancellation systems? And this obviously is pointed toward you, David. I don't know if you see the question. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, well, first, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, we haven't really pursued passive cancellation. It's an interesting aspect. Um, here's my gut feeling, though, uh, that at least active cancellation gives you more flexibility because with active cancellation, you have control over the phase shift and the amplification. So you can generate a countering signal no matter what the level of scattered signal is or interfering signal. With passive cancellation, I think it, it could work, but it's a lot more limited probably. And as I think you pointed out also in your question, there's this like bandwidth issues. Uh, maybe a passive scatterer could do a good job at canceling at one particular frequency only, but what is the bandwidth going to be? With, that, with active uh, cancellation, you have more control. I mean, there's still going to be a bandwidth limitation, of course, 
but you can design it based on the bandwidth of the amplifier and the, and the electronics and so on your antenna and so on. So you have more control over it. So I think that's the big advantage. So I think passive scattering could be suitable in some applications, but I think it's not as general as active cancellation. That'd be my answer for right now. Thank you. Um, did somebody else want to say something on that? OK, it's just noise in the background. Um, Nick asked, uh, what's the right strategy for creating test beds that bring these radar technologies together with the latest telecom systems? And I know that both, you know, Shannon, you've thought about this. Charlie, you definitely thought about this. So I'd like to, I'll call on Charlie. OK, uh, good. Thanks for the question, Nick. Um, it's a good one. I One thing I want to comment is John Chapin had mentioned earlier the Hill Air Force Base effort that's going on right now to look at radar and communications. Now, I'm not sure how this effort has progressed completely. Um, when it was first launching, I actually posed the question to them, are you looking at radar technologies and how they can be innovated to collaborate with wireless comm, or are you looking at comm technologies and how they can be innovated to collaborate with radar? And it turns out that that effort, at least from its initial onset, was constructed to look at improving comm technologies, but the radar technologies weren't being examined, which I thought was, you know, that's, that's a very needed thing. So whether we are, augment PAWR with radars or build new PAWR and NERDS test beds around radars. I mean, I think all these are viable things. I do think that the, the DOD's effort at Hill is an excellent one, but I think it's got to be augmented to look at new radar technologies. If we leave radar in the dark ages and only innovate wireless comms, we're only solving half the problem. I think those two need to be looked at in concert. So that's the opinionated soapbox I would make. Uh, Shannon, I'll, I'll let you take a stab at it. I, I'm, I'm going to answer in a, in a what's going to sound like a really weird way. And that is, I, I think, a good way that we can explore more uh, writ large um, RF test beds is to do it at ultrasonics. Here's why I say that. Cost. Cost and scale, actually, both. Because obviously you're not going to have polarization, but you can get a, a very sophisticated setup that has multiple different modalities on the order of hundreds of dollars, which means that all these universities that are playing with these things can now have very simple test beds that are actually very capable. We've got one right now we've been slowly building up that operates at a whopping 40 kilohertz. But you can do some really cool stuff with it. You can try out things that the cost to set this sort of thing up at RF would be prohibitive. And you can you can try and you can fail. That's kind of the, the benefit. You can try things and see what doesn't work and um, which kind of helps you narrow down what might work. Yeah. And I, I think that's an important point. Right. Uh, and, and Nick, again, thanks for asking that question. I mean, we're in a point where we can start doing stuff that we couldn't do before. So these test beds could take off and they could be cheap. I mean, even compared to 10 years ago, let alone 20, um, it's it's a whole different world. Um, the other one I wanted to ask. Um, Maybe, uh, Doug, so, sorry, just wanted to add um, um, something related to Nick's question, which is a great question. And uh, um, I think, you know, uh, one of the challenges that the, the power platforms have had has been the availability of spectrum, right, um, uh, for, for open experimentation and uh, um, access to, you know, broad spectrum bands. Um, and so, uh, I, I think enhancing power platforms with, um, you know, for example, with radar or, or other spectrum dependent systems uh, um, would be great. You certainly need to bring the right expertise, which the, the power platform teams don't necessarily have today. So you would have to um, create programs to do that. And you also have uh, um, a need to, to, to sort of uh, expand the available spectrum options for those platforms. And so I think, think, you know, like combining something well, like an, an RDZ with, uh, um, with, with a power platform would be a very powerful um, uh, way of uh, enabling that. Totally agree. Um, and I'm going to turn to Tommaso and John for this next one. Uh, so Richard Bennett asked, um, I'm gonna just, just going to read toward the end of it, which is, is it wise uh, to give legacy systems a free pass while imposing uh, the burdens of coexistence on the new entrants of spectrum 
chair and advocates seem to do. And again, there's a lot of, there's an assumption built in, in that question, I'll say. But um, I mean, I think there's, I think there's something interesting here, which is, you know, how do we, how do we deal with the legacy as we move forward, uh, where that we have, you know, whether it's poorly designed GPS uh, receivers or, or anything else, how do we, how do we, how should we approach this? And what's a way to, and, and maybe that's outside our panel and outside our expertise because we're a bunch of techies, but uh, I, I think there's, I think, you know, if we're going to have conquering spectrum, Tommaso, you better figure this problem out. I'm not sure that I have the solution, but, um, but, but certainly, you uh, know, uh, in terms of the question of whether it's wise to to put the burden on on newer citizens, um, I'm not sure that you know. It, it, it's sort of an incremental approach, right? You know, we, you start from uh, the from a status quo and you say, okay, how do I introduce new capabilities while maintaining, in a sense, I'm gonna say it in quotes, backwards compatibility with with what exists, right? Um, and so, um, I, I think it's it, it's a practical way to approach that. I don't know that it's the only possible way, but it's, um, it's sort of uh, uh, from the art of the possible in many ways. One thing I would add is, you know, if you, if you look at the GPS receiver issue and even the radio altimeter issue, it, it was essentially um, interference due to blocking. And you could argue poorly designed receivers. And one of the things to think about in the future is as, as new bands are looked to be opened up for, um, you know, other uses, whether it makes sense as that's being done to have a mechanism, perhaps with the C band auction, there could have been a fund for, um, replacement of faulty radio altimeters, for example, as part of that, um, knowing that, um, you know, the, the big, big media and fiasco that that ensued there is one way of handling that. So I don't think they get a free pass, but it's definitely worth looking at. And as as you all know, the FCC, um, what grew out of that is now they have a, they started a notice of inquiry regarding receiver performance. And one of the things to look at is what should, um, you know, what should be done to prevent um, or to require future receivers that are being deployed now to implement something like, I don't know how you want to define it, but good engineering practices so that they have, you know, uh, input filters and typical designs that are used today. And they don't just put in something that basically is poorly performing at the bit, you know, just because it's low cost when it actually impacts others well outside their band of operation. Thank you, John. Um, and I didn't have the uh, pleasure or opportunity to hear the earlier parts of ISART, but uh, I see a lot of a lot of good friends who think about these questions all the time. So I'd be surprised if, you know, how do we deal with grandfather devices and 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 how do we make things, you know, uh, you know time limited leases like Bill and, and John worked on before all of these sorts of concepts uh, integrated into solving this problem that uh, that was brought up. But uh, I'm sure we'll hear more at the closing at the closing uh, session. Um, trying to find the one that I, I'm moving around. By the way, in my chat, there was a uh, Kumar had a, a question I, I wanted to ask. Uh, yeah. So how practical is fine grain spectrum sharing uh, close to uh, radio interference in the in the wideband deployment? Uh, so I don't know how you know um, where the operator is seeking high availability, all the other sorts of things. This there's a bigger question here, right? Which is um, um, how fine grained, how 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 much how much do we want to pack it in? How do we want to? How should we be approaching this? And you know that's kind of like the you know the low hanging fruit are doing some simple things, whether it's you know listen before talk or other such things, which is not probably going to get you fine grained. It'll get you close, but what? How should we how should we be thinking about this? And um, I guess the second part of it is there are implications on what we are looking for small cell uh, small cells alone. Anyone want to pick up on that? Maybe maybe I can say one thing. And that, that, that I think the, the question of uh, how um, you know what, what's the right uh, level of granularity. I mean, obviously, it's it's a broad question that needs to be. 
answer technically, certainly today, I mean, in, in several systems, you can uh, allocate uh, um, on, on pretty short time scales at the level of uh, um, resource blocks. So it, it's pretty um, fine grained and, and you can uh, uh, you can have a maps of the um, different resource blocks that you want to allocate versus those that you don't want to allocate. So um, and 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 that that can be done uh, relatively easy. Now you, you, there's obviously a lot of um, uh, also computational and sensing problems related to that. But uh, um, but but I think you know it's we certainly should explore um, uh, all of these. I agree. So let me uh, let me turn to Shannon. There was a question, and this this might get you in trouble with all your uh, sponsors. But um, what band should we be looking at? <laughs> it, it, it's funny you say that because that is literally what I thought too. Um, I, I I'm I'm gonna pass on that. I, I I yeah I'm I I don't really have a good answer, and I would very much hesitate to to just throw anything out there. I'm, I'm going to pass. <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> so uh, let me ask, I, I threw some questions to you guys the other day, and um, I don't know which ones I want to touch on. But I guess if I had, if, if, I, if you could each just say one sentence, uh, what's the lowest hanging fruit? What's, what should we be doing? Um, what's the absolute? And I think you covered it in each of your talks in some sh shape or other. But what would if you if you got to talk to uh, the assistant secretary at NTIA or the chairman at the FCC or people on the Hill? What would you say? Or FCC? Well, yeah, we we have an, uh, we have uh, John on. Thank God. So we uh, let, what what should we tell John is an important thing that we should be pursuing at, at NSF. I'm going to call on people. David, start. Well, if it's NSF, I would say trying new innovative approaches, even if they're a little bit risky, go ahead and try them out and see how, how they work. And what would they be? What would be what would be a particular technology? Is it active cancellation? Is it some form of that? What what should we really specifically be trying to push to get, you know, to get the biggest bang right now in this space? Well, well that's just one of the areas that I'm familiar with. I'm sure there's many others. But yeah, I, I think in general, just innovative hardware approaches that could also augment all these software solutions. I think would be a good thing for NSF to fund. Tommaso? I would say, yeah, I mean, I don't want to repeat things that, uh, that we, but you know, all, holistic approaches that span um, hardware and software as well as uh, um, you know, multiple disciplines within hardware and software. Uh, that, that's what we really need to make advances and, and pursuing, you know, and, and having sort of, uh, I think it would be helpful to have uh, programs that are in, in size a little larger than the classical NSF programs, uh, just because that enables um, closer collaboration between um, various groups. John? Yeah, as I said in my opening remarks, I would say one of the things to really uh, consider is what what Qualcomm has been advocating for is um, the traditional approach to opening bands, whether they're unlicensed or shared in particular, um, has been defining very simple technical rules and the theory has been let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, f billions of flowers have bloomed and now we're looking at the problem where there is so much active use in bands that can actually be improved upon. And we shouldn't just give up like it's done sometimes where, oh, it's an unlicensed band and the rules are what they are. I think it's, it's worth considering um, adopting rules, one of which, as I said, is... Um, looking at synchronized looking at synchronized access in these bands where you have slotted communications and the the when you're transmitting you have a much more greater likelihood that there won't be a collision and that your communications will get through so what i would say is considering simple add-on technology neutral rules for the future to enable bands to continue to support increasing levels of 
of um, communications, which I think is going to become essential because the bands are all occupied and there's great value in these low bands that have great propagation characteristics. And we need to look at ways to make, make that the use of those bands better. Got it. I'd love to hear the details behind what that, what that would look like, but uh, I'll come back to you on that maybe sometime another day. Shannon? Oh, no problem. So, so you, you did kind of pose it as depending on who you're talking to here. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer two different ways. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we're talking more operational, um, I, I would, and this is reiterating what's already been said, but the software driven capabilities, um, you know, increasing dynamic capabilities, um, shorter time scales, you know, th this is really, that's, what's going to drive things, particularly in, again, systems like radar that have operated tended on slower time scales, being able to speed those up. Um, if we think of it from a different way though, cause you mentioned what, what would I talk to John about? Um, so NSF, so, okay. Longer time frames. Um, I, I think an interesting question is, is what happens when we get to the point where being more dynamic stops providing benefit when we get to the point where we're, we're there's no longer maneuver space and now we're all laying on top of each other um we, we were in a, a similar type of panel discussion a couple years ago uh and um uh, frank roby then mit lincoln lab now darpa raised this question of what happens when there no more there's no more maneuver space and we're all just laying on top of each other what do we do and um that that creates kind of a different perspective now. Of, um, I mean, I don't know. Does it become all sort of like CDMA? I, I, I don't know. But um, it's not an answer. It's just another question. Thank you, Charlie. This is uh, yeah. This is an interesting question. I think if if by this this is also. Uh, I, I used to read these books when I was a kid that were like, you be the coach. I don't know if any of you when you were kids saw these books, but it, it would read you through a, a scene in a, in a game of some type. And then it would say, you're the coach. You've got to make the decision. And you don't know what actually happens. You make the decision. Then you read what the coach actually decided. That's kind of what I feel like right now. If I were as a program manager, what would I do? Well, there, as I mentioned before, I think there's got to be a tranche here where we look at multi-levels. And so, the question is, I think there's, it's twofold. The first one is, what's the new paradigm going to be? I think we all have to agree on what's the paradigm of, of spectrum use going forward. And then once we agree on that paradigm, I mean, I would, I would make a case that from what I've heard today and what I continue to hear that things are moving, as Shan said, to faster time scales. I would call that adaptivity and reconfigurability. We have to be able to adapt to our environment. We have to be able to reconfigure quickly. So I think a decision has to be made in the paradigm, whether that's already made or if it needs to be researched further. And then the second thing is I think there have to be multi-level fundamental research projects initiated where, um, you know, different people at the fundamental research level and then moving forward to the applied level possibly get together and work on multi-levels from policy all the way down to circuit and may overlap two or three of those levels where uh, people are working with one another so they understand the, the limitations of their previous levels and how that impinge on, on uh, their their own work and their own setting up of a paradigm. So I would say that's what has to happen. We have to rally around a paradigm and then uh, we need multi-level teams to look at that paradigm. And I think as Shan hit on the head, we've got to move to shorter time scales. Right. I um I want to we don't we're not going to have time to actually um, dig in on it. But Nick also asked, you know, hey, does there need to be like a national spectrum strategy, uh, R and D strategy? And you know, my personal opinion is absolutely, and it really needs to be highly orchestrated and highly integrated so that we can actually solve some of these problems across the different services. And uh, you know that you know, and and again, I think Spectrum X gets to that. Uh, there's some other uh, research groups too, but I think it's still too wide and unorganized, to be honest. I think, you know, we, m many of us know each other in the spectrum space, um, but there's just so much to be done and so much research and funding that needs to happen and or organizing all these test beds. But I, I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting uh, issue. And I think it's one probably John Chapin thinks about quite often. So with that, um, we're at uh, the end of our session. I want to thank the speakers and thank the audience and also thank uh, ITS for hosting us. I, um, I really enjoyed the discussion that we had.
think we uh, talked about some really relevant issues in terms of what we can do technology wise. And I'm going to look forward to the closing session whenever that starts in like five or 10 minutes. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.